Hi, this is Dr. Eric Westman, and welcome back to my podcast. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Jason Fung on the same podcast with me. Jason, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Eric. You know, it's been a few years since I think we were at a ski place some years ago <laughs> at a keto meeting, and that it's been a while. I, I'm really thrilled to see your work thriving. And tell me uh, what's new, and then I, we'll go back to what's old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it has been a few years. I mean, I think it was COVID. I mean, we we used to get together all the time, right? We used to see each other, you know, a couple times a year at these meetings, at least, and. Um, you know, with COVID, of course, everything sort of just stops. So that was unfortunate, but, uh, you know, life moves on. So, yeah. So, um, you know, in the meantime, I've, I've sort of gone back a little bit more to focus on sort of just my clinical practice and so that, that sort of thing. So that's, that's where I've been uh, putting a lot of energy and I've been working with a couple of, uh, so, 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 you know, uh, because I'm a clinician predominantly, I'm not a researcher, right? I, I I deal with people. So that's where my passion sort of really lives. So I went back to sort of doing more clinical stuff. So I was trying to help a company uh, called Level 2 Health, which is uh, its goal is to really help people uh, put their type 2 diabetes into remission um, and to do it in a sort of larger scale because they're part of United Health, which can, of course, bring it to a lot of people. So I've been spending a lot of time doing that, uh, you know, trying to put together a program for people to uh, really, really uh, help. So they got, um, it, it, it's part of United Health and they're trying to sort of make it more uh, part of their core um, sort of offerings, which I think is very exciting. I mean, yeah, if you look at type two diabetes, which is of course where, how, how I sort of got really interested in the entire topic uh, of weight loss. Well, let's, um, let's, let's start there. Let's, let's go back. Uh, my, so my, you know, oh, Dr. Fong, he, he was a nephrologist and, you know, like a lot of doctors, he got fed up and wondered why are people needing dialysis? Uh, you know, and <laughs> how did you get started and how did you kind of, I, I don't know, it's like a wake up or a transformation for us. It happened to me too. Yeah, it was sort of a gradual process. So, um, I, I like you, I, I, I trained very conventionally. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, so I deal with kidney disease and over the years, of course, diabetes type two diabetes became more and more of a problem. We know that from all our, all our, uh, sort of epidemiologic data, there's been more people with type two diabetes, which led to more type two diabetic kidney disease. And so I was seeing a lot of it, of course, um, people going on the dialysis. If you look at the dialysis population in pretty well all over North America, it sort of exploded in the last 20 years. So what you see is the sort of uh, obesity epidemic from the late 70s, and then an epidemic of type 2 diabetes happening sort of around the uh, late 80s and 90s. And then sort of 10 years from that, you get all the sort of sequelae or the sort of complications of diabetes, including kidney disease. And you see this, the dialysis population, which is end-stage kidney failure, uh, really start to explode uh, in the 2000s, 2010s, just as I was sort of um, starting practice. So I started to see more and more of this. And really, it, it, it is a very unsatisfying sort of thing to treat type 2 diabetes uh, and, and, and type two diabetic well, kidney disease you conventionally. You manage it, right? With yeah. Drugs. I yeah. hate that term. Managing. <laughs> uh, exactly. But, uh, I, I wonder, um, but before we go further, tell me, so nephrologists can do lots of different things and practice can be done in different ways. How, what percent of your time was actually at the dialysis centers, I guess they're called. And just to give people an idea, yeah, you're, probably you're about managing... 50, 40, 50% of my practice so was half, dialysis. Half yeah. your daily hours were treating people who had no kidney function anymore. It was yeah, that's hemo, right. Hemodialysis. Yeah. So hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Yeah. And um, because they're very sick people, they tend to take a lot of time. So well, it's that's a lot of work. I, it's yeah. hard work. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I have to just say, I, I was in awe of the nephrologist and, and the the kidney, uh, basically you're substituting just about every function the kidney does, not not all though, uh, 
but the the idea that an organ fails and then a nephrologist basically has a machine that that keeps the kidney function going. Uh, but what was it like to deal with people who are they're basically tied to this machine, right? Their life. Yeah. And so some people think, oh, well, I'll just go on dialysis. Well, it it's not a great sort of situation to have, is it? No, it's it takes up your whole life, basically, because uh, it's three times a week for hemodialysis, three times a week, four hours at a time. So by the time you include setup and all that, that's four hours on the machine. By the time you include sort of setup and cleanup and, you know, getting to the hospital, getting to the clinic, getting going home and, and recovering from from it, it's sort of five, six hours every two days sort of thing. So it's it's a significant chunk of people's lives. On the other hand, it's, you know, prior like to dialysis, it. you died of kidney failure. Yeah. So it really is a technological marvel. Actually, if you think about the major organ systems, it's really the only one where it can go to zero and you can still live. Like if your heart function goes to zero, there's no machine that will keep you well, alive. Right? Oh, the Duke has one of the biggest LVAD programs, the left ventricular assist device. And, yeah. and like you, I, I've been using this method with people who are sick. And when the first patient came to me who had no pulse and had a battery pack, I was rapidly brought up to speed that there are a lot of ventricular assist device heart failure yeah. patients at Duke. And, and I man, you know, I helped them lose weight for a heart transplant which is, uh, so actually there, uh, yeah, there's no liver substitution, right? And then the lung substitution, uh, you know, you can't stay on a, a respirator. Although uh, COVID, there were, there were lung transplants and there are lung transplants being done, but the, uh, yeah, so kidney dialysis uh, is really pretty awesome. It's hard work and, and I have to say it's a money maker for the system, is it not? Because um, I, I well, I saw the a, a community have a choice. They had all this casino money, and they could either do prevention, you know, change the diet, you know, or they could build a dialysis center. And they built a dialysis center. No, <laughs> you don't want people to have dialysis. Well, but so how, how did you then figure out you could you could stop this from happening? Well, yeah, I mean, dialysis is sort of, it's a big imposition on people's lives for sure. And uh, the, the problem is that uh, it's unsatisfying to take somebody to follow people because, you know, I'm a clinician. And so I follow people and they start with their diabetes and I see them when they get their kidney disease and then it gets worse and worse and worse and then they go on dialysis. So all this time as I treat them, they're getting worse. So that's not very satisfying as a uh, profession, truthfully. So I really started oh, to think about it. Kind of like me, it wasn't a good fit for me who, to see my patients getting worse and worse and worse at a VA hospital. And, mm. and I have to say, it doesn't seem your personality is, is so great and bubbly. You want the happiness to have that as a daily drudge. I can, this is a common theme among doctors who, who went into medicine to actually fix things or, or make people feel better. Yeah, I, it's not satisfying for the doctor. Yeah. And, and so that's where I started to really think about, you know, why is this happening? What can we do differently? And that's where I started to sort of come to the conclusion that we're sort of looking at the problem all wrong. Like we, we were treating this disease, type 2 diabetes, as if it was a chronic and progressive disease. That's what and they teach. That's <laughs> what they taught it. I actually, in 2014, and on one of the YouTube early YouTube videos I did, um, I said it was one of the big lies of type 2 diabetes. Because if you think back then, 2014, you would go to the American Diabetes Association website and they'd state to you plain as day, this is a chronic disease, which means you're going to get worse until you die, right? Not a great feeling for the patient, not a great feeling for the physician. And the thing is that it was obviously and clearly a lie. There was no possible way it was true because you and I knew 
And everybody else knew, um, patients knew that, hey, if you lost weight, that type two diabetes would either get better or go away. Everybody knew somebody who was like, oh, I got diagnosed with type two diabetes. I went on metformin, but I got serious about my diet, exercised, lost, you know, 20 pounds, got off all my medications. Now my blood work is perfect, right? So yeah. like clearly, like the, the clinical experience was that this was a reversible disease. We saw it, we heard it, we knew it. Everybody knew it. And yet at the same time, our professional associations, our teachers, our clinicians, our academics were saying it's irreversible. It's irreversible. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? I see it on a daily basis, but clearly we are focused on the wrong thing. We we're so focused that this was chronic and progressive and that we should, you know, drug the hell out of these people that we forgot to take a look at the people who are actually reversing their disease because they did, of course, right? Don't, don't you think a big element of this uh, is that there's a medication focus in oh, for sure. Western medicine? To me, it's medication care now. It's uh, not yeah, medical. it's... Yeah. And I've, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's sort of the way medical education works and medical yeah. research works. Oh, oh, Cause right? they need to know the medical students need to know the mechanism that the drug is going to use. Yeah. And that's what they put in medical school. This is, yeah. this is backward, right? It's backwards because if you think about, if you think about what, um, you know, how doctors get taught, a lot of it is unfortunately driven by pharmaceutical money. Like you look at any association, American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, Cancer Association, you know, you look at who funds them, right? And you've got this huge list of pharmaceutical companies, right? So if your big meetings and so, so as a clinician, so you and I, we go to a big, you know, for me, it's a nephrology association meeting. Well, you know, millions of dollars have been pumped in by drug companies, dialysis company, whatever companies, right? And so therefore, all you're seeing are speakers that are sponsored by the uh, drug company. And there's nothing wrong with drug companies. So not anti-pharma, but pharma is focused on selling its drugs. So if, if you have a drug uh, that's made by, you know, a company X, then that company is going to find a speaker to talk about that disease that that drug treats and why that drug is so good. Of course, they're going to. What you have yeah. to do as an association is say, we're not going to take any money from anybody. We're just going to hold our meetings for scientific well, integrity. But nobody well, does I, that, right? As past president of the Obesity Medicine Association, we require people to pay to be in our vendor area. So yeah. <laughs> You know, you, have, you have to have money to be able to be in these. Anyway, back to how you got into this. So, so you're dialyzing folks. I mean, did you, what, what drew you toward nephrology? It's nephrology, different. yeah. Different, different specialties have all their own sort of um, yeah. personalities, which is I mean, you're, is you're much more colorful and animated than most nephrologists. <laughs> <laughs> Nephrology, I, I liked it because it's it's a sort of, um, I like to think about problems and why they occur and stuff. Because in the end, a lot of kidney disease winds up being dialysis. So there's a lot of physiology. There's a lot of uh, thinking about stuff, which is sort of that personality of a nephrologist, right? So we Can like to think me, about. Help me understand. In fact, I, I wondered if one day you would write the kidney code. You know, because because <laughs> uh, the kidney as a self-contained organ actually is one of the few organs like the liver that can make glucose. Mm. And, you know, it's in the fine print of medical textbooks so that the liver and the kidney can do yeah. gluconeogenesis. Yeah. And, and I've always kind of uh, anthropomorphized that the kidney was going to take care of itself and not rely on any other glucose input because there's an area of the kidney that requires glucose. Yeah. And that's how the, the renal papilla, there's the oxygen tension is so low. And this is one of the pimp questions I have for medical students, you know, was what cells really require glucose? And they say brain. And, nope, nope. I mean, maybe some glia, but no. So it's the red cells, you know, the white cell respiratory bursts. And then this little area of the kidney needs, right. needs uh, glucose, but the kidney makes its own glucose. Now, I, I've thought that, that 
that glucose the kidney makes could supply it to its own organ. I'm not sure about that. If if it gets and even <laughs> I'm then not there sure is that. A, yeah, I'm not sure how much it makes actually. I don't well I don't and, know if and it's it depends on the context, right? Because yeah. the brain is going to use glucose if you're a carb eater. The the kidney will probably won't make glucose if you're a carb eater. So that if you're now relying on the gluconeogenesis. What was amazing, the, there's so much not known still, and the um, SGLT2 inhibitor drugs that make the kidneys leak glucose and, and people who are getting infections now there um, is stimulating new science. I even had a brush with a fellow who was looking at the kidneys of, of animals who were dying on these SGLT2 inhibitors, and they were finding that they're the kidney is doing a lot more than ever was thought in the past. I mean, so I mean, we're learning a lot more about ketosis, keto metabolism, and even then the kidney is an amazing thing, but then <laughs> you weren't just satisfied in dialyzing folks. What, tell me more about that. Yeah. So, I mean, as it became more and more um, of a problem, type two diabetic kidney disease, of course, you know, it, it, it was, it was sort of um, the wrong thing to be doing because if it was a reversible disease compared to a progressive disease, then of course we had we should have been trying to reverse it and prevent people from getting kidney disease as opposed to just sort of managing it or treating it. Right? It's a totally different mindset. I mean, it's 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 you know it, it's totally different. And the focus, of course, was weight loss, right? That was the key. When you look at all these people who are doing very well, you know, what were they doing? And a lot of them wind up losing weight. Um, and that was the real key. So if, and, and again, it's one of these things that's sort of so bloody obvious when you think about it. So if you lose weight, your type 2 diabetes often gets better or goes away. So think about this chain of events. Type 2, so diabetic kidney disease is caused by type 2 diabetes. Treatment, got to reverse the type 2 diabetes. How do you do that? Well, you got to lose weight. So the root cause of the whole thing was the weight, and you got to focus on that. But how much of my daily life prior to this was focused on getting people to lose weight? The answer was 0% of my time, clinically as a doctor, right? And, and Well, you it's were like, busy. What the hell? You right? were busy but, doing your work. I know, it was. But it was the wrong work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's like, think about it. You have this disease that we should have been focused so much, like 50, 60, 70 percent of the day is focused on type 2 diabetes and their various manifestations and kidney disease. And yet zero of my time was spent thinking about the diets that were important because I was thinking about the drugs that I wanted to put them on. Right. And the whole thing was all wrong. It was, it was, and it was because of the way I was taught, the way really everybody was taught. And that's where I started really talking about it, writing about it. And, you know, that's where we sort of, uh, our paths sort of crossed. Yeah. Well, and one of the brilliant, you know, so you have so many brilliant ways of saying things and as the um, stuffing passengers in the Tokyo subway or, yeah. or, or the, the, the overfilled suitcase, you know, you're trying to get the clothes in there so that there's another fundamental difference that it, it, uh, the cause of insulin resistance, right? The, yeah. the idea that there's something wrong in this cell and we just give a medicine, we can fix the insulin resistance without regard to the inputs, you know, without regard yeah. to the glucose, carbs, raising insulin. So what is the cause of insulin resistance? Yeah, the, the cause of insulin resistance, and, and this is, so insulin resistance is sort of when people say, what causes type 2 diabetes? They say, well, it's insulin resistance, right? And that term itself refers to the fact that one of the functions of insulin is that it opens up these sort of channels in the cell and allows the glucose in the blood to go into the cell. The cell will now burn it for energy. So that's great. That's what's normally supposed to happen. When they look at type 2 diabetes, of course, they see that there's plenty of glucose in the blood. That's how you make the diagnosis. So the question is, well, why is there too much in, uh, glucose in the blood? In type 1 diabetes, there's no insulin. That's why, right? The insulin can't open up these gates to allow the glucose to go into the cell. Inside the cell is starving because there's no glucose. Outside in the blood, there's like tons, right? So if you think about like a, 
uh, you know, a restaurant or something and you have the doors locked, right? So inside it's empty, outside everybody's waiting around, lined up, right? So the type in type one. two diabetes, type, in type yeah. one diabetes, yeah. yeah. In type two diabetes, they imagine a similar situation, right? So they said that, hey, the, the there's insulin around. So that's the difference. Type two, type one, there's no insulin. In type two, there is insulin around. So people have the key, they're trying to open the door, but something's blocked, right? So the door is not opening. The glucose now cannot get into the cell and you're going to get this similar uh, situation where the glucose is piled up outside the cell. And, and the problem with that is that if you think that that's the problem in type two diabetes and insulin resistance, you could, you, you, you could sort of follow that logically. If inside the cell, there's no glucose, well, people should be extremely thin as they are in type one diabetes. They should, you know, basically starve uh, you know, internal starvation, they shouldn't have a big fatty liver, right? Because fat is a source of energy too, right? So it, it was all wrong because type two diabetes, of course, you have people who are overweight, uh, you know, big fatty livers and so on. So there's a second alternative uh, to thinking about this problem of why there's so much glucose and insulin outside the cell. And that's the possibility that that cell is simply overfilled already. So if you have, say, a restaurant or a train or whatever, and it's already packed to capacity. So say you have a restaurant and there's people, you know, completely full, the restaurant completely full, people have already jammed the inside. You open the doors, people still can't go in because you've already got too many people in there. So you think about a cell. Maybe that's just restaurant resistance. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so the same thing in a cell. If the cell has way too much glucose, well, even if you open up the gates with the insulin and say, okay, glucose, you can now go in, it can't because it's full. So then the glucose piles up outside and you say, okay, that's the problem. Now, if you think about this overflow uh, paradigm of type two diabetes, it makes perfect sense. If you have way too much glucose in the cell, you're gonna have de novo lipogenesis, you're gonna have fatty liver. As, you, as the liver fills up with fat, it's going to try and get rid of that fat, right? Because it doesn't want fat. Liver is not a place to store fat. Fat cells are a place to store fat. So the liver now tries to shuttle all this extra fat out, right? Because you've turned the glucose into fat. That's what de novo lipogenesis is. You shuttle all this fat out. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do that in VLDL, right? which are triglyceride-rich particles. So what happens? Well, you have fatty liver, you have type two, you have high blood sugars, you have high triglycerides, right? Because you've got your VLDL has gone up, which lowers your HDL and low HDL. So now you have one, you know, abdominal obesity because you're, you're shuttling all this fat outside. You've got high blood glucose, you've got high triglycerides, you've got low HDL, and you get hypertension because the hyperinsulinemia causes hypertension as well. Well, those five things are actually the five criteria of metabolic syndrome. And it's all, you know, it's all caused by the same thing. So that's why those five things all go together of metabolic syndrome, because they're all caused by hyperinsulinemia. You've got too much glucose and too much insulin. You've got overfilled cells, the, the body, the liver is just trying to get rid of this excess toxic, you know, load and causing the rest of these manifestations, which so all of metabolic syndrome can be explained by too much glucose, too much insulin, it's hyperinsulinemia. Well, the, you know, we, I know we both did our own due diligence and read back into the history, and, and it, but it's always good to have Gary Taubes put it all together in his new diabetes, Rethinking Diabetes book. But what that highlighted again for me was the doctors were using insulin to treat type 1 and type 2 diabetes before it was known that the insulin level was high in the blood. So yeah. that, um, and, and just by, you know, the more insulin you use for type 2s, you reach this kind of curve where it, it just stops working. I've had people, you know, so the U100 insulin, you know, you can't have, <laughs> don't have enough room, you go to U200, meaning double strength. And then you, I have someone on U500 insulin. That, that it's just, again, stuffing the person in the Tokyo subway, you know, you're yeah. going to have some damage if you, you're not all the exactly. way in the tube, So, you know? yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. Because if you give insulin, the insulin doesn't get rid of the glucose. 
what it does is it takes the glucose and just shoves it back into the cell. So just like if you have a subway train, which is too full, you can keep packing more people in, right? You get people, you get, you know, these people on the Tokyo subway where they all, oh, their whole job is to just shove people into the subway car. So that only makes the problem worse. So right? if, if insulin's, I'm just trying to think historically, doctors and pharma, well, if that's not working, well, let's just let the kidney leak glucose. And yeah. I remember going to a, a GSK GlaxoSmithKline meeting years ago. I had the new, you know, low carb data. I was all excited and naive. And I went in and said, you know, here, you might want to study this, you know, a drug company, you know, I, I, but you might find a mechanism, you know, this, this was, again, it was 15 years ago. They said, oh, no, you know, that LDL increase a little bit, it, FDA won't let us use any drug that raises the the LDL, you know, even a little. So I said, well, what are you working on? And they said, well, we have these new drugs that make the kidneys leak glucose. So so people can just basically eat whatever they want and they can pee out the sugar. And I'm like, I don't think this is a good idea, you know, as an unpaid advisor. <laughs> and now we have these SGLT2 inhibitors that leak glucose. What do you think about it? that pharma approach? I think the pharma approach, I mean, I think, I mean, it does work, obviously, if people do leak glucose and their blood glucose comes down. It's not a perfect solution, but on the other hand, it's not as bad as say insulin because, so so it's sort of levels of badness, if you will. <laughs> insulin oh. uh, it, it, to me is the worst because you have a situation where your insulin levels are too high and you're treating it with more insulin, which is like, okay, that's insane. Like it's like treating a hyperthyroid patient with thyroid pills, right? You're making it worse. So, so the, um, you know. The other pharma approaches, the, the Ozempic, semaglutide, GL, GIP and GLP-1s, the, the diabetologists now actually have medicines that can help you lose weight without, so using insulin basically puts people in this cycle of weight gain. And if weight is the cause of type two diabetes, it's never going to fix it. But that leads to the ADA, the Diabetes Association saying it's a chronic disease because everyone was using insulin. It's yeah. like the doctors were, it was a fait accompli. You're, you're basically sentencing people to a lifetime of diabetes if you're using insulin. So, yeah. but and these non-insulin companies actually are an ally against insulin. I mean, philosophically, because they make money by using their medications. And uh, but but let's get back to let's get back to diet because you don't really need all of that. Although there's a role for it. And so after doing a little homework, I, I never really learned how you got onto fasting because for me it was seeing a couple people doing a low carb diet. They, and it clearly worked. Did you see some people using it or or, or no. kind of got onto the, the kind of it, face validity of it? It was it was um essentially what happened was that so so as I was thinking about it, I, I was thinking that really the, the cause of a lot of these problems is the hyperinsulinemia, which is too much insulin, right? Yeah. So and it's not necessarily well, the postprandial okay. insulin, but sorry to interrupt. I was hoping when I said what causes insulin resistance, you would just say hyperinsulinemia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hyperinsulinemia, yeah, it's the same thing um as insulin resistance, right? So if you have too much insulin you know, you're basically letting that fill cell fill up with glucose, right? You have high levels of insulin, high levels of glucose, you're filling up that cell with insulin. And at some point, right, it's going to fill up and then you can't put any more glucose in. So hyperinsulinemia, the high insulin, to me is sort of the big cause of the entire problem, not just, you know, type 2 diabetes, but also metabolic syndrome, but also obesity. Because if you think about it, insulin is a hormone and it's a normal hormone, right? And its whole job is to tell you to store fat. Like that's really a big, big job of insulin. And it's not that it's a bad thing. We need it to survive, obviously. But if it's too high, like any hormone, if it's too high is bad. And if it's too low, it's bad. Thyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone, growth hormone, and the whole thing, every single hormone. It's neither good or bad. It's just that the level is supposed to be in a certain range. And if it goes too high, it's bad. So insulin is a normal hormone. So there's nothing wrong with it. But if it's in too high a range, you're going to have certain diseases, right? And it's it's pretty logical. 
because insulin, its job, so you eat, insulin goes up. As insulin goes up, your body says, you should store some of these calories because you're going to need it later when insulin goes down. Because when you go to sleep and you're not eating, your body still needs energy. So at that point, insulin goes down. Your body now says, okay, let me burn some of this energy, right? So you eat, insulin goes up. It says store energy. And you don't eat, you go to sleep. It's a fasting period. You, your insulin goes down. Your body says, all right, let's pull some of those calories back out and let's burn them for energy. And that's re the reason you don't die in your sleep every single night because your body has that ability. Now, if you have a situation where insulin is high all the time and it's way too high, it's much higher than normal levels, well, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to store more energy because you basically told your body to store more energy. So there's two situations where you have to think about, okay, why is the insulin too high diet-wise? Well, either the foods you're eating are stimulating a lot of insulin, and you have to remember that different foods will stimulate insulin to different degrees, right? So that means that different foods will tell your body to either store that energy or not, right? And the other thing is, is how long, over what period of time, are you telling that body to store, right? Because if, if it spikes up really high and then goes really low, well, you're going to start using it, right? So if it spikes up for one hour of the day and the other 23 hours of the day, it's low. Well, that one single spike probably doesn't make an overall big deal of difference because it's low for the other 23 hours. So that's why I thought, okay, well, the diet is one aspect of hyperinsulinemia. But the other aspect is how often you eat. And remember, at this time, it was like 2013, 2014, people were convinced that you had to eat like 10 times a day. Like that was absolutely necessary for yeah. optimal human health, even though in the past, people never ate that way. Why? Because there was not all this processed food, right? Like who's going to, you know, get up, make yourself eggs and bacon in the morning, eat it. And then at 1030, go and make yourself, you know, put, you know, make your bake yourself a little muffin or something just for that, right? Like, don't you have to work, right? <laughs> and so it was this whole idea that you had to eat constantly. But in the past, nobody did that. Like in the 1800s, who was snacking constantly? Nobody, everybody had to work in the field. Everybody had to go, you know, to the factories. Nobody's stopping in the middle of the day to constantly eat. Nobody was eating in the middle of the day. Even if you think back to the 70s, nobody's did eating at their desk. Did you have vending machines in your high school? <laughs> no. We Nowhere. Didn't. Nowhere. If you if if you were hungry it was the middle of like it was 10, 10 30, 10 35, or you know, is four o'clock after school, you're hungry. Your mom's like, no, you're gonna ruin your dinner, right? <laughs> There's no after school snacks. Like you just sucked it up until dinner time. You ate at those specific times because really there people are just too busy doing other things. Yeah, then, and I course, find myself saying it's okay not to eat so much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's not just the amount that you eat. It's also what you eat because different foods have different insulin effect, but it's also how often you eat. Because if you're not so, letting your body drop into well, sort of the low insulin levels, then so, you're not burning those calories. So you just saw food... Any food, I mean, some food raises insulin. So just cut it all out. Is that how you got out? Um, well, or? then I thought, well, okay. So what if you cut it all out? Like that's the logical conclusion as to what it like, how far to take it, right? And so then I thought, oh, what a bad idea, right? Everybody knew that if you had to eat ten times a day, that was just sort of a given. Uh, this is 2013, 2014. And so I was thinking, it's, but then I thought about it. It's like, well, wait, 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 wait a second. So I think that it's really bad to not eat for, you know, 14, 16 hours of a day. But wait a second, as a physician, I tell people to do that all the time, right? So if you want to, you know, you come into hospital, you have pancreatitis, NPO, right? Nothing, nil per os, you don't eat. If you're pre-op, you don't eat. If you're post-op, you don't eat. If you go for colonoscopy, you don't eat. So yeah, that's there N was NPO, non nothing uh, per oral, nothing, right? Yeah, NPO. per oral, yeah. And and even if you did fasting blood work, you had to fast. If you did an ultrasound, you had to fast. So literally every every working day, I'm telling people, well, you got to fast for your blood work. You got to fast for your ultrasound. You got to fast for, for your colonoscopy. You're, you you just had surgery. You can't eat. Like literally every day, I'm telling people. 
four or five, six times a day, not to eat, did anything really bad happen to their metabolism? No, not at all. And it was very funny because I remember at that time, I, I was taking a lot of care of a lot of post ICU patients. And people in the ICU were very sick. They'd have pneumonia or something. They'd be intubated. You couldn't feed them for different reasons. And they'd go in on like 100 units of insulin. And they'd come out and they'd be on nothing. No insulin. Their diabetes was completely yeah. gone because their sugars were completely normal. And then they started eating again, but their sugars were still normal. I was like, whoa, what happened? Like, why did they go in there with like so much insulin requirements and they come out with like none? And it wasn't happening like, you know, once or twice. I'd see it like at least uh, once or twice a month. I'd see these cases. I was like, huh, very interesting. Um, and what could be the cause of it? And that's where I start to think, what's the mechanism and so on? That, that's, that's where I start to realize that, hey, fasting's not that bad for you. In fact, it can be very good for you in those situations you know, where you have I, too much glucose. I had the great fortune of going around with Adapt Your Life, my company, and do Saturday morning events. And there would be 300, 350 people there in pre-pandemic. And I would ask, for a couple of meetings, I asked, how many of you have ever gone a day without eating? Nothing. Nobody. And, yeah. you know, and how many of you have ever seen someone else go a day without eating? Maybe a few hands, because in the hospital, we saw it all the time. Yeah. People were too sick to eat. Yeah. And, and so the, the common experience, shared experience now is that we've always eaten all the time. Yeah. And, and, and you're telling people not to. That yeah, seems so weird. <laughs> it was very weird. So as I started to talk about it, so, so then I went back into literature and I thought, well, what's so bad? What's really so bad about not eating for 16, 18, 20, 24 hours, even up to several days, right? And, and when you go back in the literature, you, you quickly find that there was actually nothing wrong. Like well, you can find nothing wrong like, unless, unless these you're studies. very... There should be all these studies showing people dying left and right, right? Yeah. Now, there there were in the 60s, actually, a few, um, but they were, like, crazy. These studies were crazy. Like, in the 60s, you did, you know, there's no research ethics boards and stuff. Like, they did crazy stuff. So, there were a few people who were not, like, they take people who are pretty skinny already and then fast them for, like, 30 days or something like that, right? And it was like, okay, that's ridiculous. I remember reading one study um, in, I think it was uh, nine, nine patients or something like that, right? They fasted them like nine days uh, or something like that. And these are skinny people, right? They didn't have a lot of obese people. Skinny people, they'd fast them like nine or 10 days, nothing to eat, nothing to eat at all. And then they gave them a big slug of IV insulin. <laughs> and it's like, why? Why? They just wanted to see what would happen. Well, I mean, you could probably do that again under close monitoring. And that, but that reminds me of, uh, of Ansel Keys. And at some of our meetings, you'd say Ansel Keys, and there'd be these boos in, from the audience uh, as one of the you know evil people in this whole story. But anyway, he did the starvation studies yeah. where the idea was, what do you do when someone's been in a concentration camp post World War II and the refeeding was an issue. All the coincidences, uh, one of my choir members, I sat next to him in a, in a choir I was in here in North Carolina, had been in that study years wow. ago with, wow. with Professor Keyes. It, it was an amazing coincidence. But th that probably got starvation a bad name in the- Yeah, it did. And the funny part about that study, if you read the, the biology of human starvation, which is the study found up, wound up publishing in the 50s, it was actually, their diet was actually 1,540 calories, which is, and, and it was a very low fat diet because they wanted to replicate what was available in post-World War II Europe. So they had- yeah high, high starch, because remember, protein and fat are, are relatively expensive, right? Meat is expensive, fat is expensive. So people were eating turnips and all this other stuff. So it was a low fat diet, uh, 1540 calories a day, which was actually 40% less than the Americans were eating at that time. But it's like, that's actually what most experts prescribed for Amen. decades, right? You're supposed to cut 500 calories. You were supposed to eat 2,000 calories. You're supposed to cut it down to 1,500 and cut the fat. 
So that was that that starvation study, which showed how bad it really was, was actually what we had been taught to prescribe for decades and decades. And then we wondered why everybody was going crazy on these diets and it wasn't working. Well, we proved it like 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Well, and uh, I have to say, uh, from your vantage point in Toronto, I think you have a more worldly view than us typical Americans who, you know, who think the whole world revolves around the U.S. You started incorporating the idea that other cultures or in religions fast and and what about that tradition what what have you learned yeah it's, it's actually science? yeah it's, that's what's very interesting because you know ultimately people have been fasting for thousands of years if you look at really any major religion they all have traditions of fasting so if fasting was really truly so bad for us well, we should have figured that out sometime it in the past been, 2000 years. It wouldn't have been years. a survival <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We wouldn't have survived. And if you think about it, it's like if you don't eat, so your, your body has this ability to store energy, which is calories, right? You can store it as glucose, right? You can store it as glycogen in the liver, or you can store it as body fat. Either way, those are the body's ways of storing energy. So if you don't eat, your body is going to use either the glucose or the body fat, because that's a source of energy. And that is precisely the reason you have body fat. You're, it's not there for looks. It's there for you as a source of energy in case you don't eat. So you're simply providing the situation where your body needs to go into its stores and burn off the glucose. So if you're a type 2 diabetic and you have too much glucose, hey, your body is going to burn it off. And that's good. You're not going to need those drugs. And I have no, no problem with those drugs, right? I, I prescribe a lot of drugs as a physician. But you can do it completely naturally for no cost, right? And if you have too much body fat, you can do exactly the same thing and force your energy to use its stored sources. And in, in other words, what you're trying to do is force your body to eat its own glucose and eat its own fat that is already stored away. And that's natural. Historically, and I, and I value the looking back, you know, that we can have information or, or even current cultures. How long do people fast? The, the uh, Indonesia, I gave a talk there and learned from some doctors there. They combine the daytime fasting with nighttime keto. And they have a group called Keto Fastosis Indonesia. And they um, actually, that's where I first learned about keto babies. I didn't know that was a term. And they were, they, these are moms who do keto diets who, and the pediatrician I met, and it's just anecdotal, of course, that, that the babies are do great when their moms don't eat carbs or as many carbs. But So historically did, I, you know, I think of Jesus going out in the wilderness with 30 days or something. I mean, yeah. it, did, was it just daytime fasting or was it total fasting or water fasting? And now I'm learning all these different, Names yeah, it's all them. different. So you have the um, you have different fasting traditions, basically. So you have, say, the Greek Orthodox who have different fasts and not sometimes what they call fasting is actually they don't eat meat, for example. They're, they're, they're cutting out one sort. You have, um, say, the Muslims who do Ramadan and they will do they won't eat from sort of sun up to sundown. So it's it's probably like, what, 12, 14 hours, 16 hours. But they, they they do a dry fasting, which means that they don't drink water either. Um, you have, say, Buddhists who will often eat uh, not eat after, say, 12 o'clock, like noontime until the next day. So they're going sort of like 18 hours, something like that. Um, so you have all different fasting traditions. Um, some, some, you know, Jews have their fasting tradition on Yom Kippur, uh, during Lent, there are certain fasting traditions and people do different things, right? Sometimes it's only like, remember fish on Friday sort of thing. That was a, a, a not a form of fasting, but a form of sort of dietary alterations on those days. 
Um, you know, so so there are different fasting traditions, and you know, every, I, I I go to a, a Catholic church, and you know, every time around around uh, Easter, they actually talk all about fasting, right? They're like, you know, it's the, the, the passages they read, they're all about fasting and so on, which I always thought was very funny because <laughs> at the time, 2013, 2014, when everybody said, oh, fasting is the worst thing you could possibly do to your body, you know, all the time I'm in church, I'm listening to the pastor talk about fasting. That's just once a week. Why you, should, <laughs> why you should fast and how it's good for you, how it cleanses you. And it's interesting because when you think about fasting, it was always tied into this idea of it being a very healthy tradition. That is, it wasn't fun. Nobody liked it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't for a good time. But it was something that you should do on a regular basis to sort of keep you healthy. And um, like even the word itself, breakfast, right? It's like the meal that breaks your fast. fast what it yes. implies is that you have to fast in order to break your fast. You can't be yeah, eating took, all the time. I, that took decades for me to break apart that word breakfast. It's, it's <laughs> breaking the, you don't want to break the fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now, now um, the, uh, what should we eat then? And and this is where we're. I I really want to get yeah. your opinion and ideas because the NIH group, one of them at least that studies fasting, ha, intermittent fasting, has them eat. I mean, a high carb meal once a day, mm -hmm. and and yeah. the results were not all that great for weight loss. And so so my approach is to teach you know low carb under twenty or thirty total grams per day. People fast from within, meaning they might eat once a day and all that. But but so how do you work in different? How do you look at the macros and and, and does it matter? I mean, could you do the Skittles fast? You know, for a you, month where you're just, you're just having you sugar. Could. Yeah, like you, theoretically you could, and uh, you probably won't get all the benefits of the fasting because you're you're you know you're eating stuff that's relatively well, let's unhealthy. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the optimal diet. I mean, getting your yeah. best. Yeah, I would. I would agree. Cutting down the refined carbohydrates, particularly, is probably you know very very important. I mean, the the whole thing. If you look at weight loss, I mean, you know, people who need to lose weight or people who type type two diabetes, you have a situation where your insulin levels are too high. We know that, like obesity is 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 associated. Like when you measure the insulin levels of people who are obese they are definitely higher, right, than normal. So yes. same with type 2 diabetes. It's actually a spectrum. So obesity, you have normal people whose insulin levels are sort of normal, then obesity where they're high, and then prediabetes where they're higher, and then type 2 diabetes where they're even higher than that. So we know that hyperinsulinemia is, and obesity and type 2 diabetes all go together. So if your insulin levels are high, then you should eat foods that don't raise your insulin levels so much. Like, I'm not sure why it's so controversial. Like, well, it's... well, but there's a two step process, right? There, carbohydrates raise the blood glucose, and is it sugar or is it glucose? I mean, and and, the, and, and that raises the, I mean, it's hard to, there's just enough yeah. things to make it hard to understand. But so I wish we go back to say sugar diabetes. But yeah, yeah. Well, well if cell. you think about carbohydrates, carbohydrates are sugar. That's just well, the that, I structure. had a conversation recently. I had to draw out, you know, G attached to G attached to G. This <laughs> is what a starch is. Yeah. It's glucose is all together it's and all... our bodies break down. So I mean, most of us don't get much nutrition training. Yeah. And most doctors don't public. either, right? And And again, it's not that hard to understand when you actually break it down to type 2 diabetes, you have too much glucose, right? So sugar is a nebulous term because it can include fructose, which is a, a different type of sugar. But let's just talk oh, about yeah, don't, don't get me on that distraction. <laughs> but if we just talk about glucose, glucose, which is, you know, uh, blood glucose is blood sugar, right? So fructose doesn't circulate free in the blood. So blood sugar is blood glu uh, glucose. So glucose, and if you look at carbs, so bread, rice, potatoes, they're all glucose. So you take a highly refined, because remember, in nature, nothing is sort of 100% something, right? It's all a mix of stuff. So if you look at carbohydrates, so highly refined, say, wheat, uh, you take the wheat berry, you take out all the, the fat, you take out all the protein, and you're left with 100% carbohydrate, which is the flour. 
Now that flour or the is basically all glucose. It's arranged in chains and you can go down through the biochemistry. It's arranged in two forms, amylose and amylopectin. And those are broken down into glucose. So it's just glucose. So if your blood glucose is too high, as in you have type 2 diabetes, your blood glucose is too high. Why would you want to eat all that glucose? Because you could eat an egg, which has zero glucose. It has protein, <laughs> which is amino acids. It has fats, but no glucose. You know, something's happened though where, where I can teach this and the people don't believe me. They want me to <laughs> prescribe them a glucometer. Now that, you know, the CGMs, you can get them, they're about $100 a month if insurance doesn't pay. And people want me to prescribe because you need a doctor's order. And they'll pay $100 a month to test out what I'm saying. And so then they'll come back and say, what did you learn? Well, I learned that if I eat the things you told me not to eat, my glucose would go up. I said, see, I guess, you know, there's a, a disconnect between not um, believing what doctors say. And I'm a doctor. Well, it's because it. it's yeah. because the, the the message is so muddied by all the other people out there, including a lot of doctors who say, oh, you should eat, you know, low, low fat and lots of carbs. Right. Oh, it's all about the calories like this bugs me the most. It's all about the calories, it's all about the energy. It's like it's all the same. It's like, how is it the same? Like there's all these people out there that are all about calories, calories, calories. I'm well, like David, David Ludwig did the article that brought together the calories in, calories out, and the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis players together in the paper, which basically said all of it, you know, it all matters at some point. Because, you know, if you do the naked and afraid diet where you're not eating anything, total fasting for 21 days, <laughs> you lose a pound or two per day. You know? Yeah, but, yeah. But I, I'm trying to get people to use the, lose weight in the healthiest manner. So what should I eat that one meal a day then? Have you have you figured out, um, or is it really just up to what someone likes? Um, no, I mean, there, there are definitely things that, I mean, you have to take your own situation. So again, this is where I think it's very strange, because if you have a situation where somebody is type 2 diabetic or overweight and wants to lose weight, then cutting down the carbohydrate makes a lot of sense. And intermittent fasting makes a lot of sense. On the other side, you have somebody who's not overweight, healthy, exercises a lot, and then they go, oh, well, I really need to go low carb and, and do fasting. I'm like, why? Like your insulin levels are not high. Why are you trying to lower them? You know, there's no reason for you well, to need I'm getting, to do I wanna, this, right? I want to be in ketosis, people tell me. Yeah, yeah. It's like, but why, right? <laughs> so it's fine well, if you want to do it. The anti-inflammatory effects, uh, but, well, you know, the emerging science there. Well, yeah. so do, do you have like a carb level or I, I think in terms of total grams of carbs yeah, per day? I, I, I think about total grams too. I mean, I, I usually try and tell people to stay under 50 grams. So I'm probably a little bit more lenient than you. Um, well, but on the other I hand, I have a book it's... that has 20, 50, 150, kind of oh, a okay, classic yeah. three tier carb intake and it's yeah, not to, all... to be honest even if you cut down to 150 most people are starting at 300 for 400 so even yeah. at 150 which we think is oh that's really high for a lot of people well, this, they'll do this extraordinarily was, well this is to accommodate the metabolism of people like one of my brothers who is naturally athletic and you know burns all that stuff off as a, he could be, eat up that eat up to that many, many carbs a day but therapeutically yeah so the context matters for diabetes under 50 total a day seems quite reasonable especially if you one meal a day or, or intermittent fast it, it, is that reducing the calories as well typically um it should i mean in in the ideal situation you will like you, the idea is not to take the three meals that you would have eaten and cram them all into a single meal right that's not the idea of intermittent fasting. it's hard to do yeah. the it's hard to do so that's good um, but the idea is that if you normally eat, say, three meals a day and you drop one of them, you should the other one should stay the same or as close to the same as you can get it. And, you know, say you normally eat breakfast, lunch and dinner, then you drop dinner and lunch and you're only eating breakfast. Right. So now you should eat as normally as possible during lunch and during dinner. You're trying to force your body to eat the glucose that's in your blood or eat the body fat that's on your body 
so that you lose glucose so you can reverse type 2 diabetes or you lose fat so you can lose body fat, right? So that's the entire idea. So if you simply eat more on the meal that you do eat, well, you're, you'll still do, you know, you might do okay because it's really hard to eat a, a single giant meal compared to three, right? When you space them out, it's easier. Um, and, and a lot of studies show this, right? If, if you eat three meals compared to two meals, uh, like, like one meal, uh, you know, or six meals, like the more often you eat, the more likely you are to eat more total. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's and I hear sort that of natural. People, people tell me when I have breakfast, I want to eat more that day, which doesn't make sense if you're thinking of a, a fuel tank in a car fueling up, but yeah. it makes total sense if you think about if you come upon an animal, you kill it, you eat it. You know, it's yeah. not like, so eating makes you want, makes some people want to eat more. Yeah, once you start, I, it's I very it. hard to stop sometimes, right? Because yeah. that's the way well, we're all built. Well, definitely with junk foods, uh, you know, the highly sugar and ultra processed foods for sure. Well, so yeah. would it be reasonable then in someone in my clinic, my world, my patients, many of whom are, are watching, that if they can't wrap their head around a strict, perfect keto diet, if they incorporate the fat, intermittent fasting, the one meal a day idea, uh, and have a little carb just that one time a day, if they can stick to it, you might get the metabolic effects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. the whole idea is that they're all, you know, part of the equation, right? So if one part, cutting the carbs, doesn't work for you at all, for whatever reason, right? There's lots of different reasons, people's yeah. diets, preferences, whatever. Um, yeah, my, my mother makes me eat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then you can alter another part. So say you do have, you can't cut the carbs very well, then you can tinker with the fasting, right? They're all different things. Or if you do have carbs, maybe there's something else you can do, change the types of carbs so that they're not so refined, right? So there's different ways to change it so that it works out for you. And, um, but I think, you know, the, the cutting out the snacks is sort of a giant like because snacks weren't part of the sort of regular diet of people until the last 30 40 50 years that part can be moved back because that's more of a societal thing rather than um we really want to do it and that was one of the big things i was uh, i had fought against in 2013 2014 was that idea that we needed to snack constantly to lose weight as in like you need to eat 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 all the time to lose weight i'm like how how do you expect that to work? Like honestly, like you, how do you lose you, you weight while less. eating? <laughs> yeah, to lose weight you eat less. I, I exactly. find myself saying that. It's like but, crazy. Well, now um, switching gears totally. I mean, then we got to wrap up. But this is so great. Can I have you come back some other time? To yeah, sure. Keep talking. Um, really great to to talk to you. Um, now in the U.S., other countries, uh, there's really no one who's been sued in the U.S. for doing this, despite people saying that it's not true. But other doctors in other countries have been in hot water from their professional standards boards and all, uh, Tim Noakes in South Africa, Gary Fetke in Australia. Have you ever gotten into any entanglements, I mean, serious ones, not just trolls on the internet, but... Yeah, no, uh, luckily I haven't. And um, part of I it is because... I think I focused a lot on the science and just education rather than like just explaining rather than saying you must. And, and you know, I think Tim Noakes were, and, and Gary both were unfairly targeted, truthfully. Um, you know, that was honestly, it was a it was a total witch hunt like that. Those stories yeah. are awful. Like they're just awful. But well, I know, you know I you, did. I know a few Canadian doctors who have been in hot water, although they it's just been a hassle and they've been able to work it out. But uh, that's sad to see. I, I would hope by now, 2024, that organizations, countries realize that there are a lot of different ways to do this. And you're, you're really just kind of a, I don't know, a patsy of someone with a different agenda other than science and helping people if you go after someone saying what you do and, and what I do. Now, yeah. in last fall, the textbook on keto diets, ketogenic diet is out thanks to Prof Noakes and the Nutrition yeah, Network. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, well, that's good to hear. And what would you want doctors to know? I think I would 
want them to know for type 2 diabetes, like even if you look at the American Diabetes Association nutrition guidelines, they've actually completely changed, right? They, um, so low carb, uh, cutting down the carbs used to be this sort of, you know, very fringe sort of way to do things. If you actually read the guidelines, they state like the low carb diet or cutting down the carbs is the diet with the most evidence like the most evidence, like not Mediterranean, not low fat, not low calorie. It's low carb has the most evidence of any diet that has been scientifically studied for improving type two diabetes. For fasting, they basically say uh, there's not a lot of data, which is true, but they do say that, hey, this is a very promising area. And um, in fact, it's it, it may be a way to achieve your nutritional goals, but without counting calories or counting carbs. So it's like, okay, well, that's pretty a pretty good endorsement, given that there is not a lot of you know hard evidence yep. at this point. But but it's like you're the best cello player on earth and you just play at your home. Nobody knows about it unless you <laughs> go out in public. I, they should be doing public service announcements know, with this. I know. It's ridiculous. Right. I mean, it's it's crazy because it's like low carb, you know, so here it is the ADA, right? So what we all reference, uh, you know, as standard normal physicians will mostly reference the ADA in the United States, right, for diabetes. They're saying it has the most evidence, yet they don't they don't say it. And even when you bring it up in big organizations like Level Two and United Health, people are like, "Really?" Like, they're like, they're well, like stunned. I'm like, "What? It's there. How it's we get, all there? How we get information? Uh, you know, I, they need to have their, you know, push it out on on TikTok or or I, I don't know. It, it uh, that's communication of getting information out is a, a whole nother thing. But I, thank you so much for for all the work you've done and with in your YouTube work, which is all available for free, you know, that people have to remember that. And um, I just want to wrap up by saying thanks. And uh, it was really good to know, really good to talk to you about what uh, you can do as a physician when you think about the upstream, going upstream and stopping people from jumping in the river that then they get all of these these consequences. Um, any final thoughts for for my patients? Now, <laughs> I know you. If you can imagine your your patients, um, just maybe uh, a few thoughts for them. I think the 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 most important thing is to remember one: it is type two diabetes is a reversible disease, right? So that's really important. And again, it all changed around twenty twenty one, right? That's when the ADA first published criteria for remission, which says remission is possible. So it's not like, you know, the, the, the reason we struggle is because we've been taught for like, as, as physicians, we've been taught for like two, three, four decades that it's chronic and progressive. And they've only changed it since 2021, right? That's like two and a half years ago. That's why nobody says it. That's why none of the dietitians know it. None of the nurses know it. None of the educators know it because it's relatively new, but you have to remember it's reversible. So therefore it all changes. So the goal of type two diabetes care is not management. As you say, it's reversing it. Like you should try to not have this disease of the diets you want to try. Low carb has the most scientific evidence and intermittent fasting can be a useful tool. And that's basically straight out of the ADA and nothing you will hear anywhere else. So, you know, that's great information because it's immediately actionable for people to say, okay, I get it. My blood glucose is high. I don't want to be eating a lot of glucose. Makes perfect sense to me. The foods that raise my blood glucose, I shouldn't be eating so many of those. That makes perfect sense. And now the science is behind you, the Diabetes Association is behind you. So, you know, so so now we have to figure out how to make it easy for people, get them to follow it and so on, right? And that's not, that's, you know, it's not to minimize the task, but at least the task of sort of the science of it is relatively like moving all in the direction. I mean, when you started talking about this, like you were a, a, a lone voice in the wilderness, right? It was like, whew. Who else was around talking about it? Not a lot of people, right? It was it was quite interesting uh, to go from that to where we are today, right? Yeah, come a long way. 
Thank you. And how do people find you? Where, where, what's the latest uh, place to learn from Dr. Jason Fung? And yeah, you can go to my uh, Twitter on Dr. Jason Fung. You can go on YouTube, just look under my name, Jason Fung. Um, and uh, there's lots of videos there. I, I, I switched over. There's my books, which are available anywhere. The obesity code, complete diet to fasting, the diabetes code. So you can go to any of those. And I also write a blog on medium.com. Um, and, you know, just FYI, medium used to let you read stuff for free. But I've been using them for years. Now they don't, but I post usually post a friend link so that if you just, you know, follow me on Twitter, you can find that friend link and then get access to the article as opposed to having to pay for it through Medium. But I like medium.com because it's 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 an easy place to keep my blog. That's all. And what's the company you're working with now again? Uh, I work with the fastingmethod.com. That's myself and uh, Megan Ramos, who is also, uh, you know, we we started sort of in our office together uh, doing fasting for large groups. And, you know, we just uh, now we're trying to take it to a larger audience online. And um, yeah, the fastingmethod.com has resources, it has groups, it has master classes, it has individualized coaching uh, available for people who want that extra help. And of course, it also links to all of our free stuff because, hey, if people just want to learn about it, then hey, we're happy to share everything we know. Wonderful. All great resources. And thank you so much for your time. Let's talk again. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Bye. Bye bye. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And check out adapterlifeacademy.com.